As an actor, he was known for playing doctors in Return of the Saint, General Hospital and Space 1999. As a producer and director, he breathed life into the stage play Amen Corner right here at London's Tricycle Theatre and was the first black producer to take such a play into the West End. Nowadays, as founder and director of the Carib Theatre Company, he still keeps his finger on the pulse. This week, we examine Anton Phillips on Make Your Mark. Anton, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you first got started up. Well, I'm from Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica and lived there probably for the first 13 years of my life. Then went off to Washington, D.C., where I finished high school and moved to New York and did college there. Went back to Jamaica, went back to America, and then scared of the draft because they're drafting every young man into the army at the time. I came to Europe, came to England. In that passing through period, it's taken almost 40 years to, <laughs> to pass through. Uh, and who knows, sooner or later, I might actually get out the other end. But then while I was here, I attended college, Rose Bruford College, drama school, uh, then went into the business as a professional actor. And here I am, yeah. having expanded, not just to, as an actor, but as a director and producer and uh, consultant to the British Council, going to Africa and so on. How did you get into acting for TV? I was in a play at the King's Head in Islington, a lunchtime play, a very weird, strange play, which I had no idea what it was about, and nobody else did either. But uh, the casting director for Space 1999 came to see another actor in that and invited me to come to Pinewood Studios to do an audition for the series. Uh, so I went down the next day, auditioned, and got the part. So that was the first big break in television, playing Dr. Bob Mathias in Space 1999. And from there, you, you produced and directed several plays for the theatre. When I left drama school, uh, the situation here for black actors was, was dire. Uh, you know, if they wanted, if there was a nice, big, fat, juicy role for a black actor, they'd go to America and bring him over here, bring a black actor over here to do it, because they claimed, oh, there weren't any black actors in Britain. And uh, when I got out of drama school, I mean, I was quite fortunate. I, I seemed to be working quite a lot, jobs dovetailing. Out. Well, what's all the problem? And then uh, there was a company called Black Theatre Cooperative, which has sort of sprung up out of the blue, uh, and sprung up out of circumstances which are quite difficult. And they started doing really exciting work. And I went and I saw all the stuff that they were doing. I remember uh, another black actor complaining to me, you know, oh, those boys, those boys down in Black Theatre Cooperative, you know, they only give themselves work, they don't employ the rest of us. And I thought, well, hang on. They started up that company to give themselves work. I'm going to start up a company to give myself work, but other people work as well. I mean, I wasn't criticizing them. I thought what they were doing was great. So I contacted one or two other colleagues in the business, and we started up Carib Theatre Company. Uh, the first play we did was a Derek Walcott play, and we wanted to do this play, and we couldn't get any money from the Arts Council to do it. And somehow, the, a university in Cologne, in Germany, heard they were putting on a Caribbean festival. They heard that we had the rights to this play. So they contacted us and they said, oh, well, we'll give you, you know, 1,500 pounds if you come and do it for a week in Germany. So we grabbed it, we rehearsed the play, we took it to Germany, we performed it there, we brought it back to England, we toured around, all on 1,500 pounds. You could do that in those days. But that gave us the start. And then after that, we were then able to get a little bit of money out of the Arts Council, because then we had a little bit of a track record, which was crucial in those days to have a track record. So that's, that's really how Carib got its first production on the road, yeah. So you went on to produce the Carib Theatre Company and uh, many successful plays after that. How did you get to produce and direct Amen Corner? <laughs> well, uh, 
oddly enough, it was done here in this theatre, the Tricycle Theatre. I brought, I brought the play here to Nick Kent, the artistic director, and I had already spoken to Carmen Monroe to play the main part in it, and she was keen, of course. Um, but I didn't have the rights. So I had to find out, A, who owned the rights to the play or who had control of the rights. And I telephoned all the usual sources, you know, French's bookshop you know, in New York and so on, and couldn't find anyone. So a friend of mine gave me James Baldwin's telephone number in the south of France. So I telephoned and uh, I said, hello, is, is this James Baldwin? He said, yeah, baby. <laughs> I said, listen, I want to do a production of uh, Aim and Corner. Uh, I presume you own the rights. He said, yeah, man. Uh, I said, can I come down and speak to you about it? He said, yes. So the next day I flew down to Nice, to uh, the Nice airport. There I was met by James Baldwin. Um, spent the weekend there having a chat with him about the play, about the background of it and everything. And it was a terrific, terrific time. Came back with the rights, had the star, you know, everything I needed, and the theatre. And it was then just a matter of getting the money, which that also came about at the time. So everything was on. It was a, one of those productions where everything, just everything fell into place perfectly. The cast was perfect with people like Carmen Monroe, like Clark Peters, um, you know, Elite Parsons and so on. But also, because it's a heavily gospel strong uh, piece, gospel music is like the blood running through the core of the piece. And I had Basil Mead as, you know, who's the um, conductor of the London Community Gospel Choir as my master of ceremonies. So, I mean, everything was just absolutely perfect. And we sold out, sold out this place week after week after week. West End producers came in, they were keen to take it. And so it transferred into the West End, to the um, Lyric Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue, which was then, and still is actually, the only black produced and directed play to have transferred to the West End of London. I mean, that, yeah, that was in 1996, I think, or no, even earlier than that, the second production was that. So it was in the late 80s. And here we are in 2008, and still that hasn't happened again, which is amazing. <laughs> you've done incredibly well. You've had Amen Corner, you've had Sweet Inspirations, you've been involved with so many very successful productions. Who has been your greatest inspiration? But it's it's very difficult to single out any one person. I mean, you can go to the obvious people, you know, the James Baldwin's, the Nelson Mandela's, and so on. But actually, the people who influenced me and influenced me when I was quite young were teachers. There are three or four teachers who stand out in my memory and things that they opened my mind to as teachers, which is what teachers should be doing. Uh, and they're the biggest influences. They, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> perhaps one thing which you might find amusing, even when I was about four years old, I was going to nurse's school in Jamaica, and there's this woman who used to run the school, Mrs. Lottie Macmillan Hart, <laughs> used to run her sunshine school, as it was called. And she had a passion for theater. She had a passion for opera and operettas. And I can remember quite distinctly as about a four-year-old being dressed up in some um, Edwardian costume, being in some operetta being put on by the Sunshine School, four years old, and, and taking my very, a very formal bow on stage at the end of the performance. And I remember that really quite vividly. I don't remember what opera it was, but I remember being on stage and the audience really <laughs> loving it, loving all these kids on stage. You know, it's, it's a truism. Never go on stage with kids and animals. Uh, you know. um, so, so from that early age, really, it has been teachers who have been my my biggest influence right up to high school in America. What do you think was your biggest challenge? Uh, well, my biggest challenge and uh, enduring fight is with the funding authorities. Because, uh, I mean, theatres like this, the Tricycle Theatre, the Theatre of Stratford, for instance, are two theatres who are very supportive of producing plays written by African Caribbean people or American people, and they have a reputation for putting on plays like that. But if I want to put on a play, I really do have to come here or to any other theatre where all the artistic directors are white 
and submit my play to them, and they will read it, and if they like it, and if it's to their taste, and so on, then they might give me permission to do it. You know, but of course, if they did a play within the last 12 months, well, we've done our black play, so you know, come back next year. And, which is a nonsense. I mean, it is discrimination of the worst sort. So my enduring fight is to get funding for our own theatre, our own theatre managed and operated by people from my community, for people from my, it's for everybody. But you know, black people come to black plays. You know, you come here to a, a play on this stage, uh, this play here at the moment is an Irish play. Come on any night, and if you see one black person in the audience, you're lucky. Right? But you go to a play put on by Blue Mountain or something, they turn out in their thousands to see it. You know, when I do a play by Trevor Owen, black people flock to it. When I did the Amen Corner, you know, people are queuing up outside to do it. When I did uh, Remembrance, which is the last play Norman Beaton did, again, they swarmed into theatre to see it. So they'll go and see plays with which they obviously identify and which they have an emotional connection to which is why you don't see, see a lot of black people in the West End, because the West End don't do plays for, um, on, as a rule for black people. They had The Harder They Come On recently at the Players Theatre, and that brought black people into the, into the West End. And we need more of that. You know, we need it on television, we need it. But until we have our own theatre, our own bricks and mortar, it's going to be a constant uphill battle. It's what's next for Anton Phillips in the theater or on TV? Or... Yeah, so we were the last project that I worked on uh, was, was a, an oral history uh, with funding from the history, the Heritage Lottery Fund. And this is interviewing a number of Caribbean people who came to England in the 50s and 60s and just getting their memories about what they left at that time, what they expected, what they found, what they're doing now, just that oral history, which is hardly recorded, really. Couldn't take the fish and chip this way. So we used to cook up with fish with seasoning. And, and that has brought me a tremendous amount of satisfaction. That'll be going into libraries, into museums, into community centers, schools. Uh, and I want to carry on doing that because there are a number of uh, other individuals over here who have made a tremendous contribution, whose stories need to be recorded. So I want to go along and, and do some of that. I was grieving, actually. I was very unhappy. Cold and stuff, I, I would not go straight back if I had the money. I could not have returned back because owning six pounds a week, and remember I've got a passage to pay back. How long would it take you to, to raise 70 pounds? You know they say we have no history. That's because we don't record our history often enough or enough. And, uh, and our history tends to be oral anyway. So use the technology that we have and get that history down and available for future generations. <laughs>